another big grand challenge for us, of course, is, is climate change. And so it gives me huge pleasure to welcome our second of our, of our shorter talks today, um, which is by Professor Dan Mitchell. Um, some of you may be aware that the University of Bristol is one of the Met Office academic partners. There are five in the UK that work very closely in that way with the Met Office. Um, Dan leads um, the initiative as far as the University of Bristol is concerned, and he is the Professor of Climate Science at the University, going to be talking about using big data to understand climate extremes. Over to you, Dan. Great, thanks very much, Kate. I'll just wait for the talk to load up. So one slight correction to what Kate said is there's actually six Met Office academic partners, and the one she probably forgot was UCL, and given where our, one of our speakers came from, uh, I should probably correct that. <laughs> so climate change is a, is a huge problem, and for anyone who's been here this morning, you probably would have heard climate change mentioned in nearly every talk here, even when they weren't speaking about climate change. And it encompasses a lot more than um, just the climate. It encompasses society, it encompasses equality, it encompasses all of the things we've been talking about today. So, so never before has there been a, uh, an issue that we can talk about more than um, climate change. Have you got the first slide up? Oh, I can just do it. So... As I said, I'm going to be talking about climate change. What I'm really going to be doing is talking about um, some of my research my postdoc, Vicky, and my PhD student, Emily, have been doing. They're, they're uh, excellent scientists, and I'll, I'll point them out as we go along. The first thing I wanted to mention about was actually the first ever weather forecast. And this was done um, by Admiral Fitzroy in uh, 1860. And he, uh, perhaps more well-known as the captain of Darwin's ship, and clearly, when you're sailing out into the Atlantic, you really want to know what the weather forecast is doing. And he is considered by, by many as the person who actually started the Met Office. And he, uh, he got funding to create the first ever weather forecast. And actually, what he did, um, uh, he did uh, is, in hindsight, was really not a good idea. Is the first ever forecast he made was actually spot on. And the problem with that was he'd got funding to get something which was spot on. And as soon as he got it spot on once, they always expected it to be spot on. And now for most of you in the UK, I think you'll realize that our weather forecasts are very rarely spot on, especially in an island like the UK. And so that was an example of where he'd taken a lot of uh, historical data, uh, which he'd collected on his ships, and he'd actually made a very good prediction uh, way above the scale of what we could do, what we actually could do uh, uh, in reality. By the way, I've added the number of weather forecasts to philosophy on the Wikipedia following Hannah's example. So it takes you seven attempts to go from weather forecaster to philosophy. So I'm going to talk about three problems we have in climate science. Uh, we have a lot more problems. These are three data problems, and I'm going to uh, show you what those problems are and then provide partial solutions. For each of these problems, we have got um, a lot we could um, learn from people in the audience here. I also want to caveat that I'm a, a physicist by training and a climate scientist. I'm definitely not uh, in the know with AI, so I'm going to talk about some AI, but um, no technical questions on that one, please. So, first of all, the problem is we have a lot, a lot of data, and we have uh, around 20 petabytes of data, and no one human being can, can analyze all of that data, so we have to understand ways in which we can interpret it. And this is an animation on the right here. Um, for those of you who are really paying attention, you'll notice it's not Earth, it's actually a, a fantasy planet from a... Um, a series called Wheel of Time. We did it as an outreach project. It could be considered as an exoplanet. Um, and this, is, this was created by Seb, who you can see in the stand in the back there. And it's funded by JGI as well. The really nice thing about this is you can just see how complex this planet is, where I'm just plotting two variables. Actually, I'm just plotting one variable, but at two levels. I'm plotting the other, other level, upper level winds, and I'm plotting the... Um, uh, lower level winds, so the upper level winds in red, that's what we call the jet stream. You can see how complex this is. And 
to scale this up, we have hundreds of different climate variables. We have hundreds of different heights. We look at these. Uh, our climate models are like this figure in the, in the bottom left. They're gridded models. They're extremely complex. Normally, when I give this talk, I say they are the most complex model ever created by, by humans. I'm not going to say that here because I think I'll be ripped apart by some of the AI people. But, but just to give you an indication of how complex they are, they, they often consist of around, um, uh, around 10 million lines of code uh, written in, in often 10 different computer languages, very inefficient code in, in, many, in many cases there. So that's one problem. Um, another problem we have is looking at extremes. And this, of course, is where a lot of the impacts of climate change occur, is in the extremes and in the tails. I put one example here um, that Vicky, my postdoc, has just published about. This was a heat wave in Lytton, which is a town in Canada. And the record-breaking temperature shattered by around five degrees last year here. So imagine living in that. Imagine how hot it is in this room and then just add five degrees to that. That's what happened in this heat wave. So this is a really serious problem, but whenever you start talking about extremes, you, you're starting to talk about the tails of distributions, and suddenly our, our modeling of those gets a lot, more, a lot more difficult. So that's another problem, and uh, you know, bearing in mind the last talk, they, there's a lot of health implications of this, uh, and there's a lot of wild, wildfires as well. And then the third problem, and this is a paper I published last year, is actually where we have available data and especially available data for the hazards of climate change. We're lucky enough that around 50 years ago we launched satellites, and that does get us some way to global, global coverage of temperatures and, and things. But to be honest, in the last decade, we're not so worried about, you know, is climate change happening? We've sort of proven that that's happening. We now care about what is climate change doing to our planet, and for that we need hazard data. And this is an example of where we do and where we don't have uh, daily mortality data, which we, we require to look at uh, heat health problems. So any orange country here is where we do not have the available daily mortality data. That might, that might be because it's not been uh, recorded or we can't get access to it because it's through a, a very uh, high paywall or, or something like that. I've overlaid in that some red dots here. These are our major population hotspots in the future. And straight away, you can tell that where we don't have the data to understand the health effects of heat waves is where we're going to get the highest populations. So this is a, re a really serious data problem as well. So I'm going to just talk about two examples here of, of, of towards solving some of these problems. And the first is um, doing what we call an attribution experiment. So these extremely complex models I talk about they're really nice because what we can do is we can take the weather of, of today and we can just put it into the future and say, how, how different would that, that weather look in the future? And that's exactly what I've done here with, with tropical cyclone Amfan. A tropical cyclone, by the way, is also known as a hurricane or a typhoon. They're all the same thing, uh, just different language for it. So this is the sort of weather feature we're looking at here. A and so... Tropical cyclone Amphan actually hit uh, pretty much two years ago um, to the day, and it hit between India and Bangladesh. So India's the, the white here, and Bangladesh is the gray here. And what it did is it created a huge storm surge. So storm surge is when you essentially just push seawater inland, and it floods uh, the local populations there. And, and the, the housing infrastructure and things like that in Bangladesh are really quite different to what we're used to in the UK. They're not necessarily um, uh, set up to, to defend against this sort of this flooding. They have huge storm shelters, but what else was going on two years ago? That was the height of COVID. Um, ramming lots of people together in storm shelters was, was causing its own problems. So what we've done here is we've taken that, that tropical cyclone and we said, well, how worse would have that storm surge in the flood have been if we have um, half, a de uh, half a meter or a meter's worth of uh, sea level rise. So what we've done is we've taken that 20 petabytes of data, we've extracted what we really wanted from that, which is sea level rise, and we've, we've, we've run our model uh, on top of that. I'm not gonna go in too much detail here. I, I'm really interested in this one here. This is the sea level rise occurring in the Bay of Bengal. 
Um, and in, in, in a low emission scenario, we're getting around 0 0.3, 0 0.35 meters increase. In a high emission scenario, we're getting nearly up to one meter um, sea level rise. Now, these numbers seem very, very small, but one meter is around up to there. And imagine that in, in your house, it's actually quite considerable. Also, think about how complex our planet is. A one meter increase around the entire planet, that's not strictly going to happen, but, but say it was, it, it is an incredible amount of energy needed to create that increase. So how does that change the populations exposed? So let's just concentrate here on the right-hand side. Um, yellow shows population increase exposed um, in India, and uh, the bluey, blacky color shows Bangladesh. The top is what we call the Paris Agreement climate goals. So that's what we're really aiming for. That's what we argued for in Glasgow um, in December. Um, we feel like we could really prevent a lot of the damage from climate change happening if we stabilize climate at that goal. But straight away for the scenario I'm showing here, you're getting nearly 100% increase in flood exposure, even at those Paris Agreement climate goals. So, so, so no one should really be assured that the Paris Agreement climate goals are not saving us from the impacts of climate goals. They're just significantly mitigating us against it. Because if you went to a higher scenario, you're getting potentially 200% increase in flood exposure. So there's a lot going on there, and we've had to use a lot of different data techniques to get to there, including these complex models, data reduction techniques, and things like that. So the scenario I've shown here is, is about the storm surge causing the flooding, but, but lots of things happen during a, a tropical cyclone. And the other thing, of course, is it rains a lot more. So why didn't I talk about rain then? Uh, it's because our models are just not fine enough resolution to really capture tropical cyclone rain. And this rather boring figure here is what you'd expect to see in a, in a climate model. It's a very blocky uh, version of rain. So this doesn't look like a tropical cyclone at all. But these are actually our highest resolution models, or, or some of our highest resolution models. This is what a tropical cyclone should look like. So how do we go from this? Admittedly, this is rain and this is cloud. How do we go from this to this? Well, one idea is to use some of the uh, sort of machine learning techniques that we, we've heard about today. And in particular, uh, my, my student who's part of the AI uh, doctoral training center here is using GANs to do this. Uh, this is still work in progress. And anyone who's interested in this area, I, I would love to chat with you. Um, we have two. Uh, two data sets we're looking at here. One is a, a, a validation data set, um, and that's where we do sort of the bulk of our modeling on in training our model, et cetera. But we also set aside a lot of our, our data to look at um, the extremes. Uh, and the point was raised earlier, and uh, this, this couldn't be more true for climate change, is that AI is very good at doing what, what you train it to do, but when you push it out of its comfort zone, it gets really problematic. And of course, the very definition of climate change is pushing our system out of, its out of its comfort zone. So we have got some real issues there. So we hold back some extreme examples. And then, so this is again what our climate model is seeing. So here are the observations, much higher resolution precipitation. This is what our climate model is showing. Once we apply some of these GAN techniques to this, this field, and I won't go into the, the specifics, um, we get something which looks a lot more realistic. So this is our uh, model simulated uh, tropical cyclone compared to the observations. And you're starting to get a, a lot more defined detail. You're starting to get a lot of the high precipitation values which cause the impacts of climate change. So what we're trying to do here is take our sort of older models, uh, what we call dynamical models. These are these millions of lines of, of computer code based on fluid dynamics, and we're combining them with AI techniques so that we're trying to get the best of, of both worlds there. One other example of where we're doing that is looking at a specific tropical cyclone. So this is Typhoon Melor, which uh, hit the Philippines in 2015. In the top here, we've got low resolution observations. Uh, in the bottom right, we've got high resolution observations. 
And once we had applied our, our AI technique to this, we can start increasing these values a lot more. So, so this is looking a lot more realistic. It's probably quite hard to tell um, uh, with this light and in the back, but the values, the peak precipitation values uh, are around 100% uh, higher in our AI thing. So that's where the impacts are coming, and that's why we're particularly interested. So just to summarize this, I've given you three examples of, of data problems we've got in climate science. We have a hell of a lot more, but I thought these were three particularly interesting to this crowd. One is that we just have too much data. Um, wh when you run uh, a very large and complex climate model, these things can take three, four, five months to run. The Met Office is, has got an investment of 1.2 billion pounds into their supercomputer to do this. When you run a climate model, you don't want to get it wrong, and you want to make sure you output absolutely everything. And that outputting everything is why we've got so much data. But even though we feel like we've got enough data, when it comes to the extremes where you need very large sample sizes, actually we have a problem there in, in that, yes, we might have to correct variables, but we don't have enough samples of those variables to, to often understand extremes. I also talked a little bit about vulnerability in the poorer parts of the world, and I didn't really address uh, solutions to that. Uh, and then I, I talked about a, an example of tropical cyclones. I talked about how the Paris Agreement goals are not necessarily our, are our savior, but they are an extremely good thing to, to aim for, and, and they are certainly better than uh, going higher than that. And then I talked about a, a method of combining our, our dynamical climate models with AI, and we're starting to get some really nice results from that. Um, and yeah, I'd love to chat with you guys uh, more on that. Just, just to highlight, my PhD student Emily is on Twitter here, and Vicky is on Twitter. Please do follow them if you're interested in uh, uh, climate extremes, they, they post some really cool stuff. So thanks very much. Okay, great. We've got five minutes for questions. This is one of the kind of the great grand challenges that we're all facing. I'm sure there must be some questions in the audience. Let's, let's kick off with a couple for Dan. Yeah, go on, Rich. Thanks. That was a really great talk. Um, is there... I know you said no technical details, so feel free to say no to this question. Is there any efforts in the field to do anything with physics-informed neural networks or AI in general? Because what you've presented there was you're using a very physics-based model and then a no-physics model. Is there some way of sort of using them together or incorporating your knowledge into your AI? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a very good question. And yes, there, is, uh, there are researchers looking at that, especially in the environment agency. I don't know if we have anyone from the EA here at the moment. Um, it's getting very mixed results, let's say. Um, so we're seeing very strange uh, uh, blurring patterns in our weather systems that we know are physically impossible. Um, so yeah, there's work going on in that space, and I think we've seen enough that we know there's, that's, that's one of the ways forward here. So there is a lot of investment there. I could see a lot of proposals going in soon on that subject. Any other questions? I have one. I'm, I'm allowed. <laughs> um, to what extent are you able to model human response uh, as part of this kind of analytics? Yeah, so we, uh, we model some types of human response. So we model things like population growth, um, land surface changes. Clearly, if, if people are moving from rural areas to urban areas, that, that changes your climate impact quite a lot. And, and that, to be honest, is why we see, in the example of the tropical cyclone I showed for Bangladesh, uh, we actually saw not too many changes there. And one of the reasons for that was actually people were moving from the rural regions which are around the coast often, to cities which are closer inland. So they were avoiding that storm surge flood. So yeah, we do, we include some sort of population changes. It's pretty basic though in what we do. As I said, we got around 100, around 10 million lines of code. Every time you change something, you're sort of multiplying that runtime by some factor. Um, and if, you, if, you're, if your model takes three months to run and then you increase, the runtime by 50 percent for, for you know so yeah we do include some but not as much as we could thank you very much um yes we have a in the second row thanks yeah, um in the room as a farmer it, looking at um, northwestern europe in terms of 
food production, especially things that are pollinated by insects. Have you looked at all at implications for food production, especially crops pollinated by insects, because you know, they don't seem to be able to evolve as quickly as, as the climate is changing? Yeah, yeah, it's a very good question. And um, my group doesn't personally look at that, but it has been looked at it a lot. So there's the, there's the change in the climatic conditions relevant for things like crops. And then, as you say, there are uh, pollinators, there are pests, and all these things respond in different ways to, to climate change. Some of them we can do quite well. So we do look at wheat, for instance, quite well. Um, and the idea there, of course, is... Um, Things like our wetter winter, winters will cause more um, clogging up of the growing because it will be more, you know, wetter soils and things like that often can lead to think, things like that. And I guess the idea is that um, there are subsequent uh, impacts on things like wildfires. So if you, if you get a wetter winter uh, yeah, and you get a warmer summer, that can promote growth in a lot of these sort of areas which potentially cause more wildfires. So these sort of li non-linear things come, in, come into play quite a lot. Yeah. OK, thank you. Last chance. Yeah, we've got one more. This will be our last one. Sorry, this is Mark Riley. It's a bit of a plug. I've got a mate called Dave Preble, who's ex-Met office. And he works out of a barn on his own in North Devon. And he claims he's got all the Met data compressed so you can run models in real time. And I think we should talk. Right. <laughs> it's called climatedataservice.com. Right. But he thinks he's cracked it. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are different complexities of models. In, um, uh, if you have a very, very simple model, it's very easy to run it in real time. If you have a fully complex GCM, I, I think the Met Office would argue that uh, £1.2 billion of investment is needed <laughs> to do that. Okay, great. We're out of time. Thank you very much. We're now going to have a 10-minute break while we set up for our second keynote, which will be Professor Neil Lawrence. So if you're interested in understanding AI, stay here. If you're interested in understanding data hazards, remember there's the workshop downstairs at 3 o'clock as well, directly underneath here, run by Dr. Natalie Zelenka. So 10-minute break. You can come and find some seats. There are still some empty seats down here. I'll give you a one-minute warning at one minute too. So see you in 10 minutes. Okay, thanks. <laughs>